Okay, good evening, uh, friends, and uh, welcome to this uh, ninth episode of the uh, Insights into Innovation uh, session. Uh, today, have, we have a very eminent speaker with us, uh, Professor Jeffrey Janis from uh, the US. And uh, as you are well aware, the uh, abdominal wall reconstruction has really gathered momentum in India over the last several years. And there are fine nuances to be learned, to be picked up from experts. And one of them, which is often not paid enough attention to, is the management and skin and soft tissue during the uh, AWR. And that, in fact, can be the source of significant post-operative morbidity in the form of uh, surgical site occurrences or, indeed, surgical site infections. So we're going to hear from an expert on what are his tricks in uh, during the AWR to take care of the uh, skin and soft tissue to uh, minimize these problems. So I would like to hand over the uh, session now to our two moderators, Professor uh, Achal Gupta and uh, Dr. Ashwin Thangavelu. Over to you, Achal. Yeah, thank you, Deep Press, President, sir. Uh, at the onset, uh, I must say thank you for inviting me as a moderator for the esteemed speaker like Dr. Jeffrey. I heard his article in uh, PRS journal in 2009, December, I think, 2019, on abdominal wall reconstruction. And as a general surgeon, this is a very great problem and we get complex hernias to operate. And uh, I remember my olden days when our boss was asking us to uh, put pressure on the side of the abdominal wall to close the abdomen under tension. Those were my house surgeon days when we were doing closure under tension. Then, then came the meshes. And then now we have the concept like AW or abdominal wall reconstruction, which includes PRS and anterior component separation, and everything. But most of all, what is important is that uh, skin and soft tissues must be handled with care, especially the management of this. Uh, as a general surgeon, I've seen people using a lot of sutures, a lot of tension in this reconstruction, and they call for a failure. There is a lot of SSOs, infections, wound necrosis, thesis, and um, almost a recurrence of hernia. Now we have an eminent speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Janis, to tackle this uh, topic today, which is management of skin and soft tissue during abdominal wall reconstruction. It's a very important topic. And uh, I think he's a very eminent person to speak on this. And uh, I give the mic to the Ashwin to introduce him. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ashwin. Good evening, friends. Today, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing an eminent speaker, Professor Jeffrey Janis from the United States. So this is a highly curated CV because his CV is so long that I would probably take an hour to discuss about all the achievements he has taken over his brilliant career. So with the permission of Professor Jeffrey, this is just a highly curated CV, which I would like to read out to you. So Professor Jeffrey Janis is a full-time faculty as a professor in the Department of Plastic Surgery at the Ohio State University, Wexner Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio. He's the chief of plastic surgery at the University Hospital and co-director of Center of Abdominal Core Health. He currently serves as the president of American Hernia Society and is a governor on the board of governors of the American College of Surgeons. He's a past president of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, the American Council of Academic Plastic Surgeons, the Columbus Medical Association, and founding president of the Migraine Surgery Society. He serves as an editor-in-chief in the Journal of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, Global Open. To date, he has served as a visiting professor at 51 major national and international institutions, published 230 peer-reviewed articles, authored 109 book chapters and six books, with three more books and an app pending publication. And he has delivered a whopping more than 3,000 lectures over this span. It is my great privilege and pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Janis, and I request the speaker to now start the presentation and start with this topic, please. Well, first of all, I wanted to Over thank to you. you. Thank you. I, I wanted to thank you all for the honor of the invitation. Um, I know this is a weekend, uh, whether it is in Ohio or India, and so uh, I sincerely appreciate all of you taking time out um, for an hour just to chat about hernias. Um, this is a great topic that's near and dear to my heart. And actually, you've already summarized the important point, which is 
that skin and soft tissue is an important part of abdominal wall reconstruction. And whereas in the past, this was relegated to maybe an afterthought or something after you've already left the room and leave maybe a, a student or a resident to go ahead and close the skin, usually just with staples. Um, we know a lot more about that these days and how it can influence and impact uh, reconstructive outcomes in abdominal wall reconstruction. So with that, uh, I've prepared a focused presentation on uh, principles of soft tissue closure. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And let me go ahead and make that full screen. <clears throat> so give me one second, because I wanna start at the beginning, because I'm sure you don't wanna start at the end. So you should be seeing my uh, title slide. Um, we're gonna go through concepts, principles, and techniques um, I do have uh, some disclosures, none of which are going to influence the science that's presented here. I want to make all of you aware that I've put all of my um, peer-reviewed references at the bottom of each slide, so you can see from where uh, these concepts are coming from and provide additional resources should you decide to investigate those on your own. These are the topics that we're going to cover today. I also want to make mention that we have reserved some time at the end for Q&A. Um, so if you do have questions, I would encourage you to put them either in the chat box or send an email to the organizers so that we can get those questions answered and have some dynamic conversation at the end. Um, I'm not gonna read you this list here. I think you can read it for yourself. There's obviously a lot to review and uh, we will take our time going through that. Um, so this is a very important slide because it underlines the, the statement that was just made. Uh, to me, this is just like marriage, where if you don't solve the little things, the little things become big things. And so the skin and soft tissue is not a little thing. If you think about this vicious cycle, which was a paper written by Julie Holohan and um, Bob Martindale and Mike Liang, uh, which was a, a multi-center database of almost 800 patients, they outlined how these little things can become big things. You get a little bit of skin separation, perhaps maybe some associated cellulitis, um, that becomes maybe a deeper space abscess that can potentially infect the mesh, which then requires its removal, which then uh, leads to potential increased recurrence rates. And now you have a recurrent hernia and this whole cycle begins again. And so if we could just stop the dominoes from falling from the outset, then we can stop or mitigate some of these downstream complications that can occur. So let's start with suture choice. Um, we all use suture of, of different types. Uh, what are the data behind this? Well, braided sutures do have a higher rate of infection versus monofilament. Slowly resorbable sutures have uh, fewer hernia recurrences than rapidly absorbable sutures. So that makes a difference when it comes to let's say closing the abdominal wall, closing the muscular fascia. Um, I myself uh, used to use permanent suture when closing the muscular fascial tissue. Um, however, I've also uh, uh, become an expert in taking these out uh, either uh, in my own patients or those patients that I see in others because of the risk for potential suture sinus formation and biofilm. Um, and actually, if you see these clinical photographs that I'm showing you of my own uh, clinical practice where I'm taking out some of these sutures, a lot of these sutures are tied with high knot bulk. There is a relationship uh, uh, between the uh, caliber of the suture and uh, the uh, strength of the knot. And so there are, uh, it's called knot security if you're not familiar with that concept, but usually more throws are required with high caliber suture and it can turn a monofilament suture into almost acting like a braided suture. And you can see here um, the type of biofilm that may be present on monofilament sutures when braided uh, or when tied with multiple throws. So these can become problematic. This is a video that demonstrates a, a revision patient that was sent to me. This obviously was not the way that the, the patient was repaired. The patient was repaired with a permanent suture. You can see here the knot bulk that's being grasped in the hemostat and how you, you can imagine how that is now going to behave like a braided suture, potentially lead to uh, suture sinus formation, sinus tracts. Uh, this patient also had infected mesh, which needed to come out uh, that was exposed. So many reasons why little things can turn into big things. So you say, okay, well, how do we mitigate against that? Are there different suture materials that we could use aside 
from choosing monofilament uh, or, or long-acting resorbable versus short-acting resorbable. One of the issues was around um, what are the data around my antimicrobial impregnation. Um, and so this was actually very recently looked at in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons a few months ago, um, and basically showing that at least in a multi-center prospective study of colorectal surgery, that you are seeing statistically significant benefits in antimicrobial impregnated sutures. So this is the latest high quality evidence that seems to sway the pendulum towards these types of sutures. But if you look back more historically, you see that there is mixed data on this, whether you look at general surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, even plastic surgery, where some studies demonstrate benefit, but others do not. So again, uh, in this colorectal surgery cohort in a very high quality study design in a high impact factor journal, uh, this seems to suggest that triclosan, which is an antimicrobial agent that's impregnated into sutures does have some benefits. So again, uh, more to come, but at least that's the latest evidence. Now, what about suture technique, not just suture choice? So again, like if we are leaving the room and we are letting uh, the lowest level student or resident close the abdomen because we say that that's not a critical part of the case. We've done our job with everything else with the myofascial releases and the mesh placement, and now we just have to quote unquote close. Well, what is the data around how important closing the, the muscular fascia is? Well, this is an oldie but a goodie. This is actually a study from 1989 from Pollock and Evans. And in this case, they were looking at a running continuous permanent suture closure of the midline of a laparotomy. And what they found was that if you were technically deficient, poor quality in closing this midline with a running continuous suture, and you left a gap of 12 millimeters or more and when you were closing that you had a 94% chance of having an incisional hernia at 30 days. So that is quite an astonishing fact and certainly a study that does not need to be repeated. So here in the US, uh, the attending surgeons are qualified to determine what is the critical part of the case and they must be present for it if not doing it themselves. So I would argue that the closure of the muscular fascia is a critical part of the case because if that's not done correctly, then 9.5 times out of 10, within 30 days, you're gonna have a recurrence and any recurrence within 30 days is usually technique related. So I would argue there is definitely technique related to this potential complication. So if you were then to surmise, okay, I'm going to make sure that this doesn't happen. So if some is good, more is better. I'm going to make sure that I get a big bite of this tissue and make sure that I don't leave any gaps. Well, then you didn't familiarize yourself with the stitch trials that were published back in 2009 and a follow-up in 2011, high-level randomized controlled prospective trial that compared taking big bites of fascia more than a centimeter back and a centimeter between with smaller bites of fascia where you're taking five to eight millimeters back and five to eight millimeters in between this should be pointed out that it's not just the distance between the suture throws, and it's not just the distance back from the midline that you're capturing with the suture. They also were using a 2-0 long-acting resorbable suture in order to close this on a small taper needle. And the concept here is that if you take smaller bites closer together with a thinner needle that doesn't create as much tissue trauma, that you're getting a better, more durable repair. And they actually showed you with statistical significance that this is the case. So if you take a look at these different suture patterns, this one is the one that's preferred. And if I were to talk to you in more um, granular terms about what this looks like, if you were back into your school days and imagining this three ring binder in your lower left and imagine tearing a piece of paper out of this three ring binder versus ripping it out from this spiral bound notebook in the right lower quadrant, that is the difference in the integrity of the repair. If you can just envision doing this in your head, it takes, takes less force to take that piece of paper out in the left lower than in the right lower. And that's the difference between taking shorter bites that are closer together versus bigger bites that are further apart. And so conceptually, this makes sense. And honestly, this is something that I do. Now, I will tell you the stitch trials had an average BMI of 26. Here in the United States, um, our average BMI obviously is much higher than that um, in, the, in the patients that we're operating on, but the concept is still valid. So when possible, 
I definitely will be using a 2-0 short acting resorbable suture on a small thin tapered needle in order to perform musculofascial closure. Now, what about dead space? So there are two types of dead space. One is potential spaces, the other is subcutaneous. Let's go with potential for 500. Look at this CT scan. Um, and in this case, a wide intraperitoneal underlay is placed and the midline is closed. And you can see this fluid collection that is developed between the wide intraperitoneal underlay mesh and the uh, abdominal wall. Now, the mesh, regardless of whether it is synthetic or biologic, whatever it is, does not act like cartilage where it gets its nutrition from synovial diffusion. This fluid collection is essentially preventing this from adherence, incorporation, integration into the vascularized abdominal wall that it sits uh, underneath. This is a static shot of just how bad this can be. And again, that you can just imagine this is not good for anything. So how do we mitigate against these potential spaces, at least in this case, by when, when an intraperitoneal underlay barrier coated mesh is placed? And so prophylactic drains can be placed. Um, now, I always use a 15 French round hubless blade drain in this space versus a 19 French, which is a larger drain and is used to drain the subcutaneous tissue. I do that for multiple reasons, but one of them is consistency because I always know because the mesh drain is smaller, which drain is the one that leads towards the mesh versus which ones are in the subcutaneous space. That's also important for my trainees to know. It's also important for the nurses to know. So again, it's consistency, plus it's a smaller caliber drain, less likely to lead to an ascending infection. I should make mention that even the knots that are used to secure the drain to the skin have some detail to it. I do not allow a space between the knot and the skin, which can allow for what's called a pistoning effect to take place, where even micro motions of the drain can potentially seed that drain and take skin flora and lead to an ascending infection that can potentially contaminate the mesh on which this drain is laying. So I even secure the knot right down against the skin, which again, may be different from your current practice. So there are technical nuances that are important to point out here. I also utilize something that I call central suspension sutures, which is just a, a concept that I made up. So it's not like it's anything super special, but I will tell you that this helps incorporate the mesh to the undersurface of the abdominal wall. In this case, this is a non-cross-linked porcine acellular dermal matrix. And what I've done is before closing the midline and with the protection of a bowel towel, as well as a malleable retractor to prevent inadvertent visceral uh, issues, I am going full thickness through the rectus complex, capturing a small bite of the central spine of the mesh and coming out through the contralateral side. And I tag that for later time. And then what you can see here is I've threaded what I call a question mark drain because of the configuration of the drain. Obviously you would not wanna put a drain right down the middle here where it would be secured into the closure. I've had that uh, happen with some of my trainees before. It's got named maneuvers associated with it. It does not go over well when that happens. So that's why you ought to make sure that you're threading the drain around these sutures. And then I'll go ahead and, and transition from what you see on the left to what you see on the right, which is a, a, a suture closure. Now I've got these tagged sutures, these central suspension sutures, and these are about two to three centimeters away from the midline. And when I tie them down and I don't snug them down, uh, because you definitely don't want to strangulate the intervening tissue, you can see here, and I'll even blow it up, that you get a nice surface of the mesh that is directly adherent to the undersurface of the abdominal wall without any fluid collection. So a combination of these sutures plus the prophylactic drain will address the potential space and help promote integration of the mesh. Now, what about the dead spaces in the subcutaneous space? Well, this is again, old school picture of some of my earliest uh, abdominal wall reconstructions. This is the way Ramirez taught us to do this in 1990 with the original description of what is now known as the anterior component separation. Back then it was the only game in town, so it was just component separation. This is otherwise known as the external oblique release. And the way we were originally taught and the way that it was originally described was wide undermining of the skin flaps. Uh, well, John Gerardo uh, lead authored uh, this 1999 paper that said that this can lead to large potential spaces that were seromogenic, 
Of course, we also know that this also uh, sacrifices blood flow in the form of perforators. And that's why this old school open approach um, had such a high complication rate. It also underscores the importance of why we're here today, which is if you sabotage the soft tissue, you're going to sabotage the repair. So we are learning um, since 1990, not only how to do things, but how not to do things. And so how do we mitigate against this? Well, a couple of friends of mine, uh, Harlan and Todd Pollock, who lived down in Dallas, Harlan unfortunately passed away about a year and a half ago. He was the father, Todd is the son and the lead author on this paper. They started talking about something called progressive tension sutures back in the year 2000, a full 10 years after Ramirez published the component separation paper, except they were talking about it with respect to cosmetic abdominoplasties or tummy tucks. So what is a progressive tension suture and how does it differ from a quilting suture? So these are 2-0 short acting resorbable sutures that are interrupted and placed in an oblique fashion. So a quilting suture just sutures skin flaps back down in the position from whence they came. They're vertically oriented. They just basically stitch the skin flap back in place. A progressive tension suture is an offset suture. So the down bite that's on the muscular fascia is more medial than the up bite, which is on the undersurface of the skin flap and engages a little bit of scarpus fascia, and that is more lateral. And so when you tie these sutures down, not only are you obliterating dead space, but you are decreasing shear stress thought to contribute to seroma formation, and you are advancing that soft tissue towards the midline. So as you can see here, what's left over is all of this redundancy, which by the way, has a random pattern blood supply furthest away from the axial blood supply, most prone to complications, and this can be resected. So not only are we getting tension-free reapproximation of the skin and soft tissue, uh, but we're also able to excise any redundant poor quality and poor vascularized skin. And they've actually done ultrasound analysis of these purposeful loculations that are developed after these progressive tension sutures are placed. And the average volume is about six cc's. And so the body is able to resorb all of these uh, little fluid pockets without issue. It does take extra time to perform in the operating room, but the cost is not terrible because you're only spending two or three extra packs of sutures and maybe takes an extra 10 to 15 minutes, just depends on how many you put in, but it has all of these advantages. And again, this is kind of extrapolated from cosmetic literature. The cosmetic uh, literature where it's used in abdominoplasties is very positive. You're seeing this study that was published in 2004 by the Pollocks in 500 abdominoplasties with no seromas. And then in 2012, a follow-up of 600 abdominoplasties, no drains and a 0.1 seroma rate. That is a good concept that's been validated. So we took this and translated this to reconstructive surgery. And we tried this in component separation, seeing if this would make a difference. And sure enough, we saw with statistical significance, an average of 600 cc's less drain output in the first three days when utilizing this technique. So the juice is definitely worth the squeeze on this and something that I would advocate for. So putting this into practice, everybody loves video. Uh, this is just a demonstration of what this looks like. I've sped this up just to make this a little bit more palatable. Again, these are uh, at the end of the case, the muscular fascia has been closed, the mesh has been placed. Now we're taking our time and any undermined tissue that we have is now being uh, obliterated in terms of its dead space with these 2-0 resorbable short acting sutures that are placed in oblique interrupted fashion. They're tagged for later tying, so we don't obscure our exposure by tying them down individually, but rather we will tie them all down at the end. And at the end, what we've done is reestablish composite tissue that's less likely to fail, and it's enabled us to excise any redundant skin and subcutaneous tissue at the end, which again is great for blood supply purposes. So it doesn't take a lot of extra time, but it does make a lot of extra difference. Now, one thing I should note is that we are still placing drains in this case. So I haven't gotten courageous enough to do this without drains, but uh, again, maybe that's uh, something for future study. Now, what about this removal of extra skin and subcutaneous tissue that we've been talking about? We have written this up in, uh, in the journal Hernia. Uh, it's a vertical paniculectomy. 
And the reason is, is obesity is definitely a complex problem and it's very pervasive. It doesn't matter which state, which country, anywhere in the world, obesity is a problem. Here in the United States, you'll notice that our color Doppler radar map of BS, uh, BMI, um, there are no cool spots. Everything is a hot spot. Um, and, uh, and by hot spot, it's just going up. It's hot and getting hotter. It's heavy and getting heavier. And so this is not a problem that's going away. We all have to struggle with it and it does impact outcomes. Todd Henneford, who needs no introduction, uh, I was just talking with him earlier this morning, actually from Charlotte, North Carolina here in the US, um, has talked about how obesity and hernias is a force multiplier because it definitely increases recurrence rates uh, and risks for incisional hernia. You also know that this excess skin is not just the result of maybe suture technique, but oftentimes you can see on the CT scan, the hernia and the hernia sac have already undermined the tissues anyway. You can see this on CT scan. You can predict that there's going to be tenuous skin uh, and soft tissue coverage after you reduce the hernia. So take a look at this patient. In this case, the hernia is already reduced but take a look and you can see both uh, at the wide angle view on the left and with me putting my hand underneath, the only thing that's left over after hernia reduction is again, poorly vascularized tissue that's based on subdermal plexus, which is a random pattern blood supply and something that can be prone to complications. So don't leave this behind. If you see a pothole in the street, do you look at it and step right in it? Or do you realize it's there and walk around it? Uh, who crosses the street without looking both ways before crossing the street? Safety first. So if you're looking at this and you know it's there, then addressing this prophylactically rather than dealing with it on the backside is definitely paramount. So what are some tips to improve outcomes? Here are some. Excise this skin, avoid T incisions, and utilize incisional negative pressure. Um, let's talk about that for a second. Um, so you're going to say, uh, okay, Jeff, why are we looking at these breast reduction patients, okay? Well, indulge me for a second and I'm gonna tell you the reason. And that's because in, in the literature, we can learn from each other across specialties. It doesn't have to be that I, as a plastic surgeon, only can learn things from plastic surgeons in general from general, et cetera. There were two papers published in the world of cardiothoracic surgery in the 90s that talked about and advocated for concomitant breast reduction in a certain subpopulation of patients who are undergoing cabbages. Um, and the reason is, is, and here's a couple of, of patients of my own, of breast reduction patients, and here's another one. You could envision, in this case, if the patient is laid supine for a breast reduction, and this is a reference mark in the middle, but let's just pretend for the sake of this discussion that that midline was going to be a median sternotomy. Well, again, you can understand why these papers were advocating for this, because in certain patients uh, who have very large breasts, who have these lateralized distracting forces that would be on a midline incision, as you can see here, you were seeing statistically significant increased complication rates in the form of median sternotomy dehiscence when doing uh, surgery on these patients. So in order, to, again, to mitigate against complications, they were advocating for doing breast reductions at the same time or before if possible. So now let's shift down a few inches and let's talk about the abdomen because the concepts are the same, even though the location is slightly different. So at the end of a case, you see here that there is a lot of extra heavy, weighty, redundant skin and subcutaneous tissue, again, prone to complications, including dehiscence because of these lateralized distracting forces that are applied to a midline incision. So I used to resect this as an ellipse, but if you think back to your days of geometry, an ellipse or, or ellipsoid, uh, or even you could call it a lenticular, excision pattern is predicated upon the fact that the most redundancy is in the middle third. But if you look at males and females and their morphologies and their body habitus, they carry most redundancy in the inferior third, not the middle third. So why are we trying to resect the most where the most doesn't exist there? So I started shifting this to, again, in order to keep this into a straight vertical midline incision and avoid T incisions where possible, 
shift this and so it became a teardrop excision because therefore you are taking more skin and subcutaneous tissue out in the inferior third which is where it exists when i was not doing this this is an example of a two-year post-op no recurrence that's not a hernia but obviously i could do better because if you take a look especially on the on the lateral view you can see that i just under resected this and although this patient didn't have any complications others can't so again, changing the geometry of your resection pattern while still keeping the incision in the midline is going to be important to help avoiding complications. That's why piercing tau clamp is my second favorite instrument in plastic surgery. My first favorite instrument is the non-conducting plastic Yankar suction tip. The reasons that that's my favorite are actually for a different lecture. So maybe I can come back and talk to you about how I use that. But how do I use this in, in the context of skin and subcutaneous tissue? At the end of the case, when you're dealing with all of this redundancy, you can use these piercing towel clamps in order to ele elevate the skin. And then using pinch uh, thickness, you can resect it. Now, an important point is that we want to avoid over resection. Al Ali, a friend of mine uh, who was uh, originally in California, uh, then he went to the Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi, and then uh, he came back to Dallas, actually, um, and uh, he's now uh, full-time at UT Southwestern. In his body contouring after massive uh, uh, weight loss, he talked about to, how to avoid over-resection by pinching skin, in this case, a brachioplasty. It could be a brachioplasty or a thighplasty, and then taking the thickness of the skin flap that you have, dividing it by two and cheating in in order to form almost a double crown skin resection pattern. This will help, again, mitigate against complications because what you don't want is you don't want too much tension on the skin repair. So while we are um, on the musculofascial side uh, performing a physiologic tension repair. Because if you think about it, the linea alba is basically a tendon on which muscles insert. So it's kind of like hand surgery. We don't do tendon repairs under no tension. Rather, we restore a physiologic tension for good function. That's what we're doing with the muscular fascia. But what we're doing with the skin in order to avoid complications is truly a tension-free skin closure. So make sure you don't over-resect. So you can do that either with the suspension technique with piercing tau clamps, or in this case, in plastic surgery, we do something called tailor tacking all the time, usually with respect to breast surgery. But in this case, you're seeing uh, with respect to abdominal wall reconstruction, I'm using a couple of Adson forceps here and using the haptic feedback that I'm getting as I'm imbricating this skin and soft tissue. Sometimes I'm feeling like, okay, if I pinch that in, that's going to be too much tension if I were to resect this. So I cheat in a little bit more towards the midline. And as I go through this technique, I'm basically customizing the resection pattern by placing these sutures. And then here at the end, when all of the sutures are placed, I'm using an indelible marker to describe what will be, again, an individualized, customized resection pattern such that when I take these sterile surgical staples out, then I've got the broad outline of what this resection pattern is going to look like, and now I can do the resection. And again, this can be customized to any patient. Another way to do it uh, is with finger imbrication. So again, there are multiple ways to do this. One is with suspension with piercing towel clamps. Another is with uh, the tailor tacking. Another is with finger imbrication. Now, once you've designed this, it's time to excise it. This is another difference that we have in plastic surgery versus general surgery, at least insofar as I've noticed here in the US, which is my general surgery colleagues, um, if they're gonna make any skin incision, they're doing it with electric cautery. My question is, is why are we causing a penumbra of thermal damage to the skin and soft tissue, which are very sensitive to that, when we're trying to avoid the wound healing complications in the first place? So I'm using sharp resection with a knife on the left in order to get down through dermis or to dermis. And then I'm using cutting cautery to get through subdermis. And then I'm using coag to then get through subcutaneous tissue. So there is technique involved when you're doing this resection to, again, avoid complications, um, because that's the last thing that we want or need. If you're going to go through all of this time and trouble, then do it the right way instead of forming complications from the outset. Once we've resected the skin, and again, I'll just show you a video kind of putting this all together uh, and reinforcing this technique, 
Um, here, we're going to use the piercing towel clamps. Um, we're going to outline this. And in this case, you know, in, in my practice, I've got a, a fair amount of experience with doing this. So whereas I used to use a double crown and actually draw my double crown, I'm already accommodating for that when I'm designing this pattern here, which is why you see one circle instead of two. I'm making a sharp excision down through dermis sharply. Uh, and then I'm using coag on my electric cautery. And as you can see here, I'm doing a sheer face cut in order to uh, remove this so that I'm not undermining the tissues. I'm doing targeted hemostasis. Fat is very sensitive to thermal damage, okay? It's, it's actually poorly vascularized, especially relative to things like muscle. So I'm being very judicious about how I'm cauterizing so I don't create any problems. And then after the resection, if there's any dead space whatsoever, I'm gonna go ahead and obliterate that with progressive tension sutures. And of course, as a plastic surgeon, and even as a patient, when they look down, they wanna see a scar that is acceptable. So I'm gonna make sure to pay attention to being meticulous about lining up the closure and then closing, uh, and that's that. Now, the T incisions that I talked about earlier are things that we wanna avoid. On the left, I downloaded that from the internet. On the right, that is a patient of mine. So there are complications that can occur at the confluence point of these right angle incisions. And we know that that's nothing new. You obviously are familiar with that. So what can we do to, again, mitigate against this? So Chuck Butler from MD Anderson has talked about this and, um, and coined this the Mercedes closure. As you can see, the configuration of this particular scar pattern does resemble a Mercedes sign. Again, I have no conflicts of interest, certainly get no kickbacks from Mercedes. But if you understand this flap design, you see it's got certain advantages. So for instance, right here in the middle, you see that this has now got oblique angles rather than a right angle. So you have more blood supply that's able to get to this confluence point. On top of that, you have this skin flap that's now based on axial blood flow, which is the superficial inferior epigastric arteries. You have one on the right, one on the left. And these arteries provide more robust blood flow to the skin flap and again, help decrease complication rates. And then finally, if something were to occur, it would likely occur at this confluence point, which is much more easily manageable when it's not in this very poorly hygienic area of the body. So it always struck me as interesting that we place the most problematic incisions right where we don't want it, which is in the least hygienic portion of the abdomen. I should also make mention that that's why when I place my drains, especially my mesh drains, I don't bring them out low, I bring them out high because I don't want them anywhere near a hygiene issue. So there are some technical pearls. Now here's what we're not gonna talk about. Believe it or not, these are two different patients. I know the morphologies look the same. That is a separate lecture. We can talk about that maybe some other time because I've got a, a whole, different slide deck that, that involves technique around that. So we're not gonna talk about that. Now, uh, again, I, I will go ahead and show you a movie uh, and you're like, why are you showing me this? Well, I call this the predator paniculectomy. It's just a reterm of the Mercedes paniculectomy. Here's a patient who I asked to lose weight. She did with diet, exercise, lifestyle modification, not even surgery. But as you do this Mercedes technique, to me, when I was doing this, it reminded me a lot of this great movie Predator, it's an oldie, but a goodie. But when I looked at that, I was like, okay, I'm calling this a predator paniculectomy. Again, just something that I made up. And at the end, you've got a much more acceptable incision and used incisional negative pressure. Okay, so this is kind of a, a, a different option. I'm just gonna touch on this is that as the patients get bigger, as the paniculus gets bigger, you are more prone to having complications. And so how do you deal with that? Again, this is more of a topic for a different lecture, but I wanted to introduce the fact that negative pressure wound therapy can be your friend. In this case, the expected complication rate on skin and soft tissue complications, they near, it nears 100%. We know that we're gonna be prone to things like dehiscence, infection, and fluid collection. So how do we address that on the proactive side? So I call it, again, I'm just making this up. I called it the string of pearls, French fries. So what we do is we take these vertically oriented struts of black open cell poly polyurethane foam sponge and we insert them into these spaces that we've developed. So why is it called a string of pearls? That's because we leave some of the tissue open on purpose, and then we close some of it, and then we leave some open, and then we close, and then we open, and then we close, and so it resembles a string of pearls. 
in the pearl part, we are sticking these vertically oriented struts of foam so it can wick away fluid from underneath the, the, the skin and subcutaneous tissue. And then we put a crossbar on top of it and put it to negative pressure. And if you think about it, it's just an, an incredibly aggressive drain, which acts as a sink through which all of this fluid, is, and it also is essentially a delayed primary closure, which again is a more controlled situation than an uncontrolled situation with a lot of the dehiscences that occur in patients with this BMI. The scar quality is perfectly acceptable. You can see here, that's the same patient after healing. Here's another example, higher risk patient, we're using a silver impregnated foam. You can now get the idea of what the string of pearls looks like on the left and, and the construct on the right. Again, we've written about this both in book chapters and in papers, you can see the references here. This is a large sponge that we're using not only for the crossbar, but for the vertically oriented struts. And here's just a video to bring this to life for you. So again, you know, we're taking these vertically oriented struts we're putting them through the pearl part, if you will. Um, and then in between on the string part where we've kind of had this primary closure, um, we're gonna put in some skin protectant in the form of zero form. Um, and then we'll put the crossbar on top of that. And that's through which these struts will connect. So it's connecting each strut to itself. And then we'll apply the negative pressure and it does all of the things that we just talked about. So again, it's a way to have a controlled delayed primary closure and also mitigate against seroma. Now, what about drains? Um, if like you, uh, you ask yourself, I ask myself the question, okay, well, how, how do I manage my drains and, and who taught me how to do that? Well, most often the answer is, is, well, that's just the way I've always done things or that's the way my attending taught me when I was in training. So how long do you leave drains in? That's a common question, right? Um, so some people leave it in after a certain amount of time and then they take it out. So other people uh, wait for a certain volume of residual effluent before they discontinue it. What does the data say? So in this meta-analysis of over 500 patients, which, which looked at level one evidence of, of six randomized controlled trials, between volume controlled discontinuation and time controlled, volume controlled had the more statistically significant results. So if you are going to have a choice, volume is the criteria rather than time. Um, we also studied drains, and we uh, just for the purposes of time, I'm kind of cutting to the chase here. Again, you can see the evidence in the peer-reviewed references at the bottom of these slides. But in order to maximize flow and proper drain management and hygiene, keeping the internal drain length long and the external drain length shorter, again, within reason, I mean, you have to be mindful of the convenience of the patient. You don't want the external drain tubing to be so short that they don't know what to do with it. But um, enough space redundancy, you know, to be able to, let's say, safety pin to their binder or what have you, keep the internal drain long because it increases flow rates, keep the external drain short. Um, when you're using drains, uh, take a look at the difference in flow rates. We compared 10 French versus 15 versus 19. They do have incredibly disparate flow rates. And again, if the purpose of drains, which by the way, nobody likes, patients don't like them, surgeons don't like them, nurses don't like them, nobody actually likes drains. But if you're going to put them in, then at least put them in the right way and put in the, the, the right stitch and put in the right size. Um, because if you make them too small and you don't take care of them the right way, they can get clogged by either um, uh, debris or even clot. And what's the utility of a clogged drain? Nothing. Um, you even can look at the, the, the bulbs, the reservoirs uh, in which the, they are serving as evacuation vessels. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you use the small grenades or the large canteens. They actually still generate the same amount of pressure as long as you do it the right way. And again, we published on this because... I downloaded this picture from the internet in the lower right. I don't know why people do this. Maybe they get bored of just squeezing it side to side. But the amount of negative pressure that's generated when you do this quote unquote bottoms up technique that's demonstrated on the lower right versus a good squeeze side to side, which you see in the upper right, is a tremendous amount of difference in negative pressure. 112 on the upper right versus negative three on the lower right. So it definitely makes a difference. If you're going to put drains in, make sure that they're, they're, they're being utilized properly. And of course, I'm taking pictures like this on the floor and going to speak with my nurses about our protocol, because what, what good does this serve when you round on your patients in the morning and you have a completely full reservoir uh, with no suction on it whatsoever? That is not a, a high quality drain. 
So we study this and it, it turns out that once the drain is 25% full, it generates 50% less pressure. And once it's half full, it generates two thirds less pressure. So our protocol is to empty these, especially at first, every two hours. And that's not only done to help uh, strip the drains because at first you're having more blood than serosanguinous fluid. Eventually it transitions through serosanguinous to serous. But especially at first, when the drain tubes are more likely to get clogged with blood, we're stripping them more often and we're emptying them more often so that they're functional. Um, so again, here's just kind of a summary of the findings, and that's what we published back in 2018. So I'll draw your attention to that. Um, so putting this all together, again, just for a video, just to make sure it's all clear to everybody, we've done our progressive tension sutures, uh, suture technique. And now we're gonna line this up with staples uh, and in order to do a tension-free closure. It's interesting, Alfie Carbonell just published a, uh, he's a good friend of mine from Greenville, uh, South Carolina. There was a paper that just came out about a month ago that talked about comparing staples to a complex layered closure. And in the general surgery literature, there are statistically significant benefits to a complex layered closure versus staples. <laughs> That's nothing new to us. I mean, we've learned that forever. Uh, I'd have to turn my card in as a card carrying plastic surgeon if I ever stapled the skin. Uh, so we just haven't done that. But again, this is a great venue to share ideas and research between disciplines. And so that's a nice thing to share between general and plastic surgery. And then incisional negative pressure, again, I have no conflicts of interest, but, but the incisional negative pressure um, is a topical negative pressure dressing that can do all of these things that you see listed here. And again, you have the peer reviewed references at the bottom of the slide. This is a different negative pressure than placing this on open wounds or open surfaces like what you saw with the string of pearls French fry approach. This is on top of a closed incision. And in the hernia literature, this was originally published by DeVries back in hernia in 2017, where they looked at patients in whom that they had done this type of intervention at the end versus those who didn't. And they kept this on for at least five days and they saw statistically significant benefits for this incisional and negative pressure. Um, we actually looked at this in, our, in a subset of our own patients and we published this last year. We published this in hernia where we looked at uh, about 260 uh, patients and we kept it on for six days instead of five and we did a linear regression. And interestingly, we found that this was associated with a decreased seroma rate. And on subset analysis, we also proved the concepts that we just talked about, which is that this skin resection, this vertical paniculectomy of poorly vascularized, heavy weighty, uh, redundant skin and subcutaneous tissue was um, associated with decreased SSO rates. So again, there's science behind everything that we're demonstrating here. Um, and so it makes a difference. Um, now, what about uh, meta-analysis? Uh, Devinder Singh, um, uh, who's a good friend of mine, used to be in Maryland. Now he just took the chief job in Miami. Uh, he published this back in 2015, a meta-analysis where he showed that SSIs decrease with closed incisional negative pressure wound therapy. Um, and actually he showed that it was cost effective when your expected complication rate was higher than 16.39%, which by the way, if you're using Cantor's grade, that would be a Cantor's grade two or above. So these are patients with um, usually at least two or more comorbidities, um, including things like smoking, diabetes, uh, obesity, uh, hypertension, coronary artery disease, et cetera. So if you have a, a patient that you expect to have a, a higher than 16% chance of complications, this is indicated and it is also cost effective. Uh, and again, uh, summarized here uh, for you in this article, um, all of the concepts that we've reviewed today. Um, so with that, uh, we are now concluded. I will stop sharing my screen. I said that we were gonna save some time at the end. So we've saved about 15 minutes uh, for Q&A. I would be happy to answer any questions. And again, tremendously appreciate the honor of being with you here today. So thank you again for the, the kind invitation. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Jeff, I think lecture. that was uh, absolutely exhaustive. You know, I mean, there are so many small points to be learned uh, in something that we all felt that we knew it all. You know, I mean, we've been doing it for several years, but there are so many tricks, starting with this, how you take a stitch on the drain and how there should not be that uh, piston movement on the drain, which can cause uh, ingress of uh, organisms 
from the skin. Absolutely fabulous. So a few questions uh, that I have in front of you. So uh, somebody has asked that uh, if you have a patient with a really large sac, that's almost sort of reaching the linea semilunaris. And to excise that sac, you're going to have to raise the large flaps. So in those patients, would you choose uh, an ACST over PCST or would you still go ahead? I mean, in these uh, patients, we know that by and large, the uh, component separations have today moved to in favor or have moved towards uh, PCSTs, posterior component separation. But in patient with really large wide sacs, would you choose the ACST ever? It's a great question. And I first want to make mention and say thank you. And I'm glad that you characterized the talk as exhaustive instead of exhausting, uh, because <laughs> that would be a difference. So thank you for that. Um, so uh, if you think about it, if there's hernia sac that is out as far lateral as the semilunaris or more lateral, then that must mean that the hernia was there already because that's where the hernia sac was. So that means that the hernia has already undermined the skin for you. And in those situations, the anterior component separation is the way to go because you already have kind of bought the complication rates that have historically been associated with the anterior component separation. It's a high quality repair. It's just that in, in several studies, it has been shown that open anterior component separation has more complications than posterior because of the skin undermining. Well, when the skin has already been undermined, then again, you've already bitten the bullet on that. Um, I would also make mention that recent evidence from Todd Henneford out of the Carolinas group has demonstrated when comparing his cohort of 700 patients done multiple different ways, that although his statistically significant uh, complication rate was lower in posterior component separation versus anterior, that you can obviate that difference with good patient selection and using perforator sparing, minimally invasive techniques, uh, like what Chuck Butler described in his articles back in 2011 and 12. So that's not to say that actually an anterior component separation is inferior to posterior. I actually would advocate that everybody know everything because the more tools you have in the box, the better. I myself sometimes do anterior, sometimes posterior. In the situation that you described, I would do an anterior separation because I'm already there and I do want to remove the hernia sac and I do want to address the skin and I already have great visualization of the semilunar line. So I'll go ahead most likely, it depends on the width of the hernia defect, but in those situations on wider defects, I'll probably do an anterior and then I'll manage the skin using the principles that we just discussed. Now, if it was a smaller defect, which is probably, you know, a situation that can occur if you have a narrow defect but you have a lot of loss of domain, like a mushroom that's kind mushroom, of going yeah. through the abdominal wall and then blossoming out on the other side like a dumbbell. In those situations, I actually would probably do a retrorectus approach, place um, uh, uncoated synthetic mesh in the retromuscular space. If I needed to, I would do a posterior, posterior component separation to get the midline closed. But again, that's a narrower defect. A lot of these bigger hernias with big hernia sacs that extend out far laterally, they already have wide defects. So again, I'm already doing the anterior. So I hope that answers the question for you. Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, so so when the... you say anterior component separation in that scenario, your mesh is going to be placed in a non-lay plane, I presume. So I is do not correct? like I do not like to do on-lay mesh in complicated patients that either have several comorbidities, which place them at risk for complications, or I don't love to do it in widely undermined tissue if I can help it. The onlay is not my favorite choice. It is more seromogenic. The only person who seems to have shown a decreased complication rates or I'd say acceptable complication rates with onlay um, is, is Guy Veller uh, from Memphis. And I've sat on panels with him before. And at first, when I saw him doing that, I was like, OMG, I cannot believe that you're doing this. We've already learned how not to do this, okay? But when, again, you have to pay attention to the details. And in, in, in later conversations that I've had with him, both on panels and personally, the key to his success and his publications on this is proper patient selection, limited undermining, and utilizing the method of adherence that he utilizes to no. secure the mesh. 
he's actually using skin staples that he uses on top of the mesh to secure it down. And then he's taking a lot of fibrin glue and he's smearing it or spraying it on top of this mesh, which is acting like a thousand points of fixation and truly fixating that mesh down to the abdominal wall. That's how he's getting around some of the complication rates associated with an onlay. So if you have good patient selection and adhere to that technique, I don't mind an onlay. But to answer your question, in those situations, you know, I will usually, let's say an anterior component separation is usually a barrier coated synthetic mesh. Um, and even though um, it is my preference, and I want to be clear that I like to place midweight macroporous uncoated polypropylene in large sheets in the retromuscular space, which we routinely do in a posterior component separation. In an anterior component separation, I'm usually doing a barrier coated wide intraperitoneal underlay with at least five centimeters on all sides, if not more. Um, that's still an acceptable way of placing mesh, um, but it does have the disadvantage of placing intra-abdominal mesh. Right. And uh, there's a question from uh, one of the uh, surgeons who's attending. Uh, what would you say about the debate between the uh, polypropylene versus polyester? So if you were to put a barrier coated, would you prefer something like uh, parietine, which is uh, polypropylene, or paritex, which is uh, polyester? So do you have any strong feelings on uh, either coated or uncoated polyester versus uh, polypropylene? Well, so I do have strong feelings about one thing, which is if we are going to place intra-abdominal mesh, it must be coated. Okay. So that I would never place uncoated mesh intra-abdominally. So that I do have strong feelings on. I think that's probably goes without saying everybody would, would agree. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the argument of polypropylene versus uh, polyester, you do have some folks who feel strongly. Those folks are usually in favor of polypropylene. And their argument is, is that in the long term, you have complications associated with polyester that you don't have with polypropylene. The problem is that the data on which those opinions are based is small sample sizes. When you look at long term, what does that mean exactly? Because long term can mean anything to anybody, and it's not definitively proven. So at this point, absent good, high quality, large sample size subpopulations with good long-term uh, outline, I'm talking about five years or beyond, because the, in order to prove something that has such a low rate of, of uh, incidence, you need more patients over a longer period of time. That's the issue with studying this, is that the incidence of these types of long-term polyester-based complications could be so low that you need a study of that caliber to show it and we don't have it. So I actually don't care whether it's polyester or polypropylene. I do care whether it's barrier coated. Um, so I will use anything that my hospital gives me uh, as long as it adheres to those principles. Right. Uh, in most of your slides and the uh, movies, we saw the uh, low suction variety of drains. So is that your preference as against some of the uh, high suction variety in which there is a tall canister which is pre-charged and it's uh, actually generating far more suction. So would you say that you prefer the uh, uh, low variety which can be emptied daily and charged daily as against the ones which uh, can just stay with the patient for four or five days and then you keep marking them? So uh, it doesn't matter. Um, actually, the first 24 hours, I put the patients while they're in the hospital to wall suction. So mm -hmm. it's continuous low wall, so, or, sorry. Yeah, I keep it at about 110, 120 millimeters of negative pressure uh, on the wall. And that's mm -hmm. done basically right after surgery overnight. And then the next morning when I see them, I transition them to bulbs. Um, it has been studied, the difference in negative pressure between small and large canisters. And as long as you're maintaining good negative pressure, then the size of the reservoir doesn't matter. What does matter is how quickly the, the reservoir fills up. And as we showed, at least in these passive devices, the more it fills up, the less pressure is being generated. So you're seeing a decline in efficiency. Now the nurses don't love me because 
who likes to do anything every two hours? Well, yeah. yeah. Try turning a patient, log rolling them every two hours, like we used to do, like for our pressure sore patients, et cetera. Nobody loves to do that. Everybody's overworked. Nobody has the time, but it does. It's a little thing that makes a big difference. So I suppose that if you wanted to, you could use a larger capacity reservoir to help make things a little bit more amenable to the nursing staff. But as long as you have enough negative pressure generated, it should not make a difference. Right. And uh, so this is a personal query. I mean, I've used the French fry technique or the uh, string of pearls very occasionally in clean contaminated uh, wounds. Previously, there was a thought that if you've done a laparotomy in a, in a patient, say with peritonitis, it's safer to leave the subcutaneous tissue open and let it heal by secondary intention. But that has its own uh, perils. So having seen this technique, read about it uh, in the past few years, I have used it on a couple of occasions. So would you say that uh, you would take these patients back to theater every five or six days? And once you find that the tissues are granulating, you just uh, take those French fries out and close them secondarily? Or how, how would you manage them beyond the uh, index surgery? So the answer is no, uh, although you'll find different people doing different things. So in my experience, as long as you keep the pearls to a small size, small to medium size, there, and, and by the way, I should make mention that when I stick the French fries in the pearls, this is a crazy talk that I'm even saying this out loud. It's funny. I'm listening to myself saying, what, are, what kind of scientific talk are we having when I say, when you stick the French fry in the pearl? Anyway, so when you stick the French fry in the pearl, I'm angling my finger at the very base of it and creating a J or an L so that right. each strut internally touches the other one. And if you think about it, it creates an internal crossbar across the bottom and then goes through the skin vertically and then assembled has a crossbar on top. It's almost like an I-beam, a steel I-beam. And so that's allowing a very aggressive egress of fluid really locks down that dead space, actually allows you to heal a lot faster than you think. And is the reason why I don't think a subsequent operation is necessary because the, the picture I showed you where I showed a before and after that took place after about two and a half to three weeks. So it's not like they have open wounds forever. And I don't need to have another general anesthetic, another operation and book them again, either as an inpatient, you know, if they're still there or as an outpatient once they've been discharged. Now you go to Carolina's and you see what Vedra Augustin has uh, written about and talked about with delayed primary closure. They will take the patient back several days later or even up to a week or two and they'll place a, a, a negative pressure device and they will take them back. Um, I, I don't find that necessary, but again, the way they're doing it is they're not, they're not creating the pearls. They have a big open space, so it's not healing as fast. It's a larger area. Um, you take a look at what Karen Evans uh, uh, is doing in Georgetown. Um, in some patients, they are pre-placing sutures uh, in a vertical mattress fashion, and then they're stuffing a, a, a vac sponge underneath those sutures and they're tagging them so that at the bedside where you already have the sutures placed and as the negative pressure is kind of sealing things down and you draped on top of it, when you decide at whatever point you decide to peel off the drape, you already have your, your sutures which are ready to go and you I can start like cinching those down. So there are three different ways to do it. Um, I don't actually care how it's done, but I like to avoid the necessity to go back to the operating room if I can help it. Yeah, I think I think the difference is that, uh, you know, since their name doesn't start with uh, a J, they've not figured out, figured out the J trick. You know, the J drain. It's so obvious. And I don't J, know why J, I just J, didn't J say sponge, that. Yeah, J sponge and the J drain. Yeah. I think that, that's clever. Yeah. Uh, it, listen, if level five is expert opinion and level six is just my own, that's some great level six evidence right there. <laughs> and you just heard it. No, no, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions, Ashwin, Achal? Uh, do we have any uh, other yeah, questions? Yeah, there's the a question. Uh, yeah, Dr. Jeffrey, if you're operating on a hernia with a patient who had colostomy or elostomy, which is to be closed simultaneously, how do you tackle these patients? So, colostomy and hernia. Yeah, so, uh, you know, that, that's a great question. So, um, there is evidence around placing synthetic mesh in these types of patients, you know, and it, it's usually being placed uh, as part of a retromuscular repair. 
Um, and again, this is not a heavyweight microporous mesh. Those have definitely been shown to uh, um, be unable to resist infection once seeded. So in a colostomy takedown, I definitely would not be using that type of mesh. However, a midweight macroporous uncoated mesh that can be placed in any assortment of ways, um, including a cruciate uh, incision if you, if you needed to, um, if it was, a, let's say, a colostomy revision and you needed to recite it on the other side and you were taking care of the peristomal, or in that case, let's say you're just doing a reversal of a colostomy and now you've got a hernia that you're repairing. I'm doing primary repair of the hernia with suture. Um, I'm doing that both on the posterior side and the anterior side. And then in between that, I am not uh, concerned about placing a midweight macroporous mesh. Um, again, understanding latest evidence that in these patients, this is not gross spillage, you know, um, it's not a, a CDC class four dirty case um, that you, you can do a simultaneous repair. Um, so that, that's how we're handling it. That is different from the CDC class four case. We do have a paper that's accepted it's not, uh, actually, I think it is out as published ahead of print. Um, I think it is. It, actually, it's, it's called a delayed immediate repair. And basically, we looked at, um, at uh, uh, staging these in some, in, in, in these really dirty cases. We call it Monday, Wednesday, Friday cases. So like Monday, we're going to go in, we're going to take out the infected mesh, we're going to wash everything out, uh, we're going to temporarily uh, close the abdomen with, let's say, a Whitman patch, we're going to leave the skin open. On Wednesday, we're going to take the patient back, we're going to wash them out again, we're, you know, we're going to make sure the anastomosis is intact, we're going to take a look at it, we're going to make sure that there's not a leak or a complication. And then on Friday, we're going to do a definitive repair if everything went well on Monday and Wednesday. And we compared not only the outcomes, but the cost effectiveness of that technique versus actually doing single stage technique. Um, and we showed some, pr some pretty good outcomes in a pilot series. So again, like you're asking me more of a CDC three, you know, um, or two yeah. depends. Uh, I'm, I'm saying in the extreme situations, there's also evidence about doing uh, staged techniques. Yeah. Okay. So, Professor, we know that uh, putting a large intraperitoneal mesh and fixing it in an open is going to be challenging. So could you just tell us your technique? How do you generally go about fixing those meshes? Great question. We have an article on it called Strategies for me uh, Mesh uh, Fixation. Um, so I can send that to you if you want to. So uh, our preferred technique is transfascial sutures without the need for skin undermining. So we will orient the mesh intraperitoneally when we're doing this type of repair. I prefer a barrier coated skirted mesh and the skirt is important. Um, we will place orientation sutures. These are usually number one long acting resorbable sutures that are placed at the junction of the skirt in the planar portion of the mesh. The reason why they're placed there is I don't want to violate the barrier coating. If you think about it, if the purpose of the barrier coating is to resist adhesion formation, then why are you violating it with umpteen sutures? So in the skirted portion, we're able to secure the mesh without violating the, 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 the barrier coating. And then using a Carter Thomason suture passer and an 11 blade scalpel, I'm making a little nick incision um, and I'm using a suture passer uh, like we would do in laparoscopic surgery. So I do not need to undermine any skin and soft tissue, which I've heard other people mention that in order to securely fixate mesh, you have to raise skin flaps. That is not true. You do not need to do that. And then I will anchor those down at 12 o'clock, three o'clock, six o'clock and nine o'clock. And then I will bisect that again. So now we have you know, in between 12 and three is one, three and six is another. So that's eight sutures. And then if needed, I'll bisect that one more time for a total of 16 sutures, okay? So I'll go as far as that. And then lately I've been for efficiency using an absorbable tacking device, which I will then use to place in the skirt portion of the mesh perpendicular to the undersurface of the abdominal wall. And I'll place a crown of resorbable tacks uh, to basically bridge the rest so that there are no interstices through which a bowel can internally herniate. So, um, you know, some of this is to taste. Uh, I, I like placing at least eight transfascial sutures. Just so you know, when I do my retromuscular posterior repairs and I'm using an uncoated 
uh, mesh in a completely retromuscular position, I still place eight sutures to fixate the mesh to make sure it's flat, taut, planar, and wrinkle-free for better integration into the muscular tissue. I don't want wrinkles. I don't want waves. I don't want migration. There are some who don't use tax to any sort of fixation at all, and they say that it's fine. And that's fine. You're going to find people who do that. There's, there's nothing definitive saying you absolutely need to do it or not. But that's how I do it, both in the retromuscular position and the intraperitoneal position. I have in some the, movies the, on that I could show you if we had time. Yeah, no, in the, on the, in the, in a, in a, I mean, I'm just trying to figure this out. You have a laparotomy, you're putting it an intraperitoneal mesh. Uh, so you would be able to elevate the mesh and go on one side and tack it. But then how would you tack the other side? Because I mean, where would you pass the uh, tacker from to tack the uh, opposite side? Let's say you tack along the left flank. How would you get your tacker in to tack along the right flank? So if you think about it, so I'm going to keep the midline open. I'm going to mm -hmm. place my, uh, uh, my intraperitoneal mesh down. I've got a bowel towel protecting the viscera. Um, and then because of the skirt, I'm able to place all of these sutures, let's just call it 360. And then while I'm still looking at all of that, then I can fill in the rest of the gaps with tacks, right? Because I'm placing them in the, in the skirt portion to the undersurface of the abdominal wall. And now after all of that is placed circumferentially, now I place a prophylactic drain down and uh, to the extent that I want, I can also put central suspension sutures in, which by the way, do violate the barrier coating. I usually put no more than three of them in um, and I tag those so that at the end, I can tie those down and that helps elevate the mesh against the undersurface of the abdominal wall. But you can go 360 before you close the abdomen at all. Then after everything is placed, sutures and tacks and drain, then I close the midline and then the only thing I have left over are the three central suspension sutures that I then uh, tie down. And that's right. that. So if, if I follow you right, the, the, the tacking is happening on the mesh, which is elevated rather than the way we do it at laparoscopy. That's correct. From inside. You, that's you're doing that's it why, the, yes. Right, right. That is why that is why that is possible and why what you were thinking in your head about how is it possible on the other half, you can't do it on the other half if you're placing the tax through the planar yeah. portion of the mesh, yeah. then, then yeah. you'd have to be intraperitoneal to do it. Right. I'm not doing that. I'm placing everything at the, if it's an angle like this, and this is the skirt, and this is the barrier coated planar piece, I'm placing it basically at the junction right here of where my yeah. fingers are touching my hand in this little space so that yeah. I don't have to go underneath. I, we follow you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so, so any other questions, Ashwin, from uh, the la participants? Last or... question, if I may, sir. Yes, please. Yeah. So nowadays we have a lot of these newer procedures, you know, coming into work, trying to get the mesh outside the abdominal cavity, trying to reduce the complications which we can have with a dual mesh, possibly with additions and being problematic at a later period. So how comfortable are you using these intraperitoneal meshes or how common is it for you to use these intraperitoneal meshes in your practice? Great question. Um, so just to clarify, my first choice is always going to be um, an uncoated midweight macroporous synthetic mesh placed in a retromuscular position and if given the preference, it would be a posterior component separation with proper skin management anyway, okay? So even if there is not a lot of undermining, whatever undermining exists, because Mike Liang actually showed us, and I did not mention, that when he published his ventral hernia risk score, Mike is in Houston, and he's, he's obviously published a tremendous amount of high quality evidence in hernia surgery. He showed an odds ratio of 2.3x more complications in terms of SSOs with undermining that is more than two centimeters. So whether the hernia has done it itself or whether I've done it in order to facilitate identification of healthy musculofascial tissue in the midline, because we all know that hernias cause a fascial attenuation, right? You look at that linea before you repair it and it's, it's thready, it's weak, 
Oftentimes it's cheese wired, um, it's poor quality tissue. I, we all feel comfortable making bigger holes because we know how to fill them. That's why we're here. So what we don't wanna do is leave that nasty tissue behind and close it, that's going to fail. So I actually take my time and I get back to healthy muscular fascia fascial tissue to reapproximate at the end. In order to do that, sometimes I have to undermine to a limited extent some skin flaps so that I can see where the good quality fascia is. At the end, according to Mike's data, we want to have less than two centimeters of residual undermining, which is why I will cut off any redundancy and secure whatever I can with progressive tension sutures. So back to the original question, my preference is retromuscular synthetic mesh and a posterior component separation with proper skin management, like what I just mentioned. That being said, in larger, wider hernias, um, or maybe if there has been sacrifice or damage to the posterior sheath during the first part of the operation, um, uh, or uh, let me think of whatever else I can think of that would obviate that. Um, or actually, as I mentioned earlier, if the undermining has already been performed by the hernia sac before I even got there, like the way out wide hernia that we talked about, then at that point, I will say, okay, I think it's more worthwhile to do an anterior component separation and switch my plane and mesh to a barrier coated intraperitoneal wide underlay. How often am I doing that? I'd say probably 25 percent of the time, you know, 25 to 30. Um, but the remainder of my repairs are like what I first described. But I do think the important point is that it's not that intraperitoneal mesh has been definitively proven to be bad in all situations and that all of them eventually have complications or fail. That's not true either. I think as versatile hernia surgeons, we need to have as many available tools as possible because we need to be able to adapt you can't use the same hammer to hit every single nail. And so honestly, I'm not doing component separation when component separations are not necessary. Or if they are necessary, I'm not committing to a bilateral either. I'll do a unilateral and I'll see if I can get the muscular fascia together. And if I can, I'm done. I don't need to burn the other side. We all know that as good as we all think we are, there's still recurrences. It can happen to anyone. It definitely happens to me. So why burn all of your bridges and play all of your cards at the index operation. Um, and so I'm also not one to go back and do different releases. So Eric Pauli from Penn State has published a limited series on doing, let's say, a posterior when you're, have, you know, have done an anterior in the past, leaving only your internal oblique intact. I haven't seen lar high quality, uh, larger studies with longer term follow up to determine whether that's safe either simultaneously or in a staged fashion. So I myself, will not do one when the other one has been done. And we all know that redos are not as effective as the index operation, except the only caveat to that is I'm sure you've seen where operation reports say that something was done. And then you look on the CAT scan and you're like, it doesn't look like anything's been done. Or you get in there and you're like, where is it? I haven't seen it. This is intact completely. So I think you know, if you're redoing your own and you know who did the first part, you know, the first time, then I think, you know, a redo is not going to give you as, as much uh, medialization as an index one. That's why I save as many cards as we can for later operations. So I'm just trying to give you a sense for what my algorithm is in, in my head and why I think that you have to have as many tools as possible. Thank you. But, uh, Thank one, you so much for the question. question is there. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. From a doctor, one, what is your take on uh, self gripping meshes? In the retromuscular plane, I mean, uh, yeah. because uh, you don't have required suturing. So, would you be happy putting just a self gripping mesh and uh, not put so many uh, transfacial sutures? I think, I think the audience is going to think that somehow I met with you before this talk and asked you to ask me questions like these. Okay. <laughs> So in 2016, we published a pilot study on what was then the largest cohort of patients that were treated using retrorectus self-gripping meshes. And that was published already. Uh, I can pull it up here in a second to see what date is coming out. I'm almost sure it's coming out in October of this year in PRS. 
is a follow-up, more patients, longer period of time on the same topic. There is nothing else that I've seen that's like it in the literature that has looked at this very narrow slice of patients, only patients in whom have retrorectus self-gripping synthetic mesh and what the outcomes are after years. And so again, this speaks, cause you know, the self-gripping mesh is polyester, right? So that kind of speaks to the earlier question about is there a big deal between polypropylene and polyester? I've talked to the company who makes um, this mesh and I've asked them, I said, for those people who are concerned about putting in polyester of any type, including self-gripping, are you coming out with a polypropylene that's self-gripping? And they say, yes, of course, they've told me yes now for four years. And I, I've even talked to their chief research person. So I've said, you know, when is this coming out? What is so hard about designing this? You're doing other things with other polypropylene meshes. Why not this one? So. I'm hearing that actually not only are they going to come out with that, but they, I've also asked them, what about larger sizes? Because wouldn't it be neat? Because uh, right now we only have a 20 by 15 or a 30 by 15 centimeter uh, planar mesh of self-gripping. Give me a 30 by 30. Give me a 40 by 40. I mean, forget, you know, you know what would get me to stop using uh, transfascial sutures of any type, which by the way, when we looked at our own patient study of in the, the 2016 paper, those patients who had self-gripping mesh, we did not use any transfascial sutures on. And we compare them to a cohort of patients who got a different type of mesh that was retrorectus, but we used transfascial sutures. 50% less opioids after the self-gripping mesh and one day less in the hospital, 1.1 day less. So when you don't need to place all the sutures, you, you have less pain, faster, safer hospitalizations. So now imagine that we have more tools because we have bigger self-gripping meshes. I won't put any transfascial sutures. I won't put any tacks. I'll just lay down a big sheet of it. The hard part will be getting it to not stick to itself because it's a little bit unwieldy when you do that and lay it down. Now, one last thing I'll mention that's a technique uh, uh, thing. Sorry to be long-winded. I'm tr just trying to be thorough. But I placed the, the self-gripping side down. There are some people I know who flip that upside down because it's slicker and smoother on the backside where it doesn't have the grips so that when they put it in that posterior sheath and it's closed and you're kind of configuring it, it's easier to move and manipulate. The problem is, is that those grips, which by the way, are made of a vicral like material, they dissolve and go away, but they're there. That's then right against the muscle fibers, which by the way, still have contractile function. And more importantly, it's right up against the deep inferior epigastric vessels, which in the lower quadrants are totally exposed during that, that approach. And I don't like to have grips up against vessels because I'm worried about that. So that's why in, that, in those patients, I'm flipping it so that the gripping side is down and the smooth side is up that's touching the muscle and the vessel. So I just wanna make mention of that too. Uh, no, so you said you looked at these uh, patients in the long term. So two sort of sub questions. Uh, there is some feeling, uh, if, there is some literature in the laparoscopic groin hernia that if you use a self-gripping mesh, the seroma rates tend to be slightly higher. So did you find that in this uh, cohort? And what were the uh, findings of your long-term uh, uh, paper? Did you see more recurrences in the ones in which the transfacials had been put in or the self-gripping ones? Nope. Uh, it was, it's, it's showing great long-term decreased complication rates and decreased, um, uh, or sorry, and acceptable recurrence rates. I think we had one patient recur, maybe if I remember in that cohort. So it's durable over time. Now I admit to you, it's not a 10 year study and we all know that hernias look good, you know, usually for a certain period of time. So the combination of the short-term study in 2016 and the long-term study, which will be published in 2022, assembled together, it's saying that you have uh, less complication rates, less pain and shorter hospitalizations, or sorry, yeah, all of those are true in the short-term. And in the long-term, you're still seeing durability. Okay. You know, at that time, we're not expecting pain, right? So right, pain yeah. is not going to be a, a big factor because they're already well out of the hospital. So really the focus of the long-term paper was not on like a 30-day or a three-month or a six-month complication rate. This was on like, what are the long-term advantages, if any, of this mesh? 
And again, I have no financial in interest in any company. So I, I don't speak for them. They don't see my stuff. They don't ask me about it. I don't know what they do with this. They probably like it, but I have nothing to do with them. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jeffrey, for uh, spending uh, almost an hour plus of your uh, Saturday morning with us. And uh, I would like to hear also acknowledge the, uh, all the help that we always get from our uh, media partners, LabGuru and uh, Meditorch, and the knowledge partners, uh, Medtronic. So thank you very much once again. Uh, thank you, Ashwin. Thank you, uh, Achal. And uh, have a nice uh, day ahead, Jeff. And uh, good evening to uh, everybody here in India. And thank, thank you, very, you much. very much again. I'll make a shameless plug for anybody who wants to go to the American Hernia Society meeting in Charlotte. Uh, it's going to be in about two and a half weeks in September. Um, I think the dates are the 14th through the 16th. I think it's a Wednesday through a Friday. So for anybody that's interested in this and other topics, uh, we have 16 sessions of power pack stuff. So hopefully we'll see you guys there. Thank you very much indeed. Yep. Thank you so much. Bye. Professor. Bye -bye. Take care.